was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. And he came up, and he touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, this young man who had died, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother, and fear gripped them all. And they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen amongst us, and God has visited his people. So um, this is a, it's a great passage, and it's, there's a lot of stuff in it, but I just wanted to encourage you with a couple of things here. Um, certainly, to begin with, there's a great picture here of a widow. And she's a widow indeed at this point. No husband and no son to care for her. She, she is a widow. She is destitute. She is a widow indeed, incapacitated to care for herself. And Christ, while he may have been moved emotionally in this scenario, he was moved very cognitively as well. He saw this woman who could not take care of herself, and he gave her son back to him to care for her. So this young man goes to the grave, and he is raised again to care for her. A great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, no doubt. But it doesn't stop there. The passage goes on to say a couple of other things here, which should be a huge encouragement to us, particularly as we enter worship this morning. Um, so obviously a picture of Christ, and um, uh, Christ does this not because the widow came and asked, um, he just made the observation, and he, he reached out and he touched, or he visited is what the passage says. And so an obvious inference uh, to what would be in the book of James where true and undefiled religion is defined, and that is visiting orphans and widows. And so they exclaim, and no doubt a crowd of this size, uh, fearful, there would have been all kinds of fear there, but certainly one type of fear that was in that crowd was reverence. They recognized this person, and the most honorable title they would have given this man at that point most likely would have been prophet. So it was a term of honoring him, um, but then it says he visited his people, and that touches on the core. The question which is answered in this passage is why did he visit? And why did he visit us? And the answer is in the passage. It says that he spoke. So he was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead to speak. That is to say to serve. So are we. We are visited by Christ. We are raised proverbially from the dead. And it will happen for us in eternity. Um, but we're raised to speak. And so in, in concordance with this worship service this morning, you and I have been visited by Christ. We've been saved to speak this morning, to speak in prayer, to speak in praise, to speak in response to the word which will be preached. Um, that's why we're saved, to worship him and to serve. And so this morning I would encourage you, put that before you this morning. God has visited you and me by means of death, burial, and resurrection. He has visited you and me that we might speak. So let me uh, lead us in prayer here momentarily. We'll provide a few minutes, uh, a short time of, of pondering that in preparation for worship, um, that you might prepare yourself to speak. Father, thank you for this passage, how gloriously rich it is. Um, <clears throat> in what it says to us. And uh, Father, we're grateful. We are grateful that you provided um, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that uh, he yielded himself up uh, to pay the penalty for us um, and that uh, he was raised on the third day. Oh God, we look forward to our final resurrection and uh, until that day, we're grateful that you have visited us, your people. Beginning in eternity past, when you laid your, your, uh, your touch of love upon us, uh, that we might be your people. And then in due time, you did indeed, in, uh, in time, visit us and save our souls. 
And so we're gathered here this morning to honor you, O oh God, the one who has visited us, who continues to visit us and sustain us. And our response, O oh God, is gratitude for who you are and what you've done. And in addition, uh, may we be a people who speak back to you words of gratitude and honor and praise do your holy name. Please continue to pray. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Well, let's together uh, praise him, honor him, speak to him gloriously together as we sing hymn 179 together, hymn 179. Please stand with me. pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to be assembled here this morning. May we look upon you this morning, united in the union which you've established uh, and in which we strive to maintain according to your precepts. So this morning, receive the worship of your people, appraised by the works, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that your name might be lifted up in all of our hearts and that we would speak forth your truth. Uh, of redemption to a lost and dying world. We pray this in the name of our glorious prophet, Lord and King Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, let's confess our sin together. Let's confess who Christ is and let's confess our gratitude toward him. Uh, we'll do that. If you'll open your bulletins, we'll do that by reading this relatively short prayer. Um, inadequate for the task, but nonetheless, uh, I trust for you and I will express the contrition of our hearts and our desire to honor him this morning. So if you would, pray this prayer with me. Lord, we abhorred ourselves on account of the defilement which cleaves to us. Behold, we are vile. We can but only lay our hand upon our mouths and put our faces in the dust. We have experienced a thousand proofs of your goodness, the remembrance of which fills us with shame because of our ingratitude. The height of our folly lies in having so often sinned 
against your infinite goodness and love. We have abused your kindness and affronted your mercy. O oh Lord, we beseech you, pardon our iniquity, for it is great. Please continue to pray. Oh God, we have set ourselves before you as you've called us to do, uh, to give honor to your name, um, to uh, speak uh, of your weight and glory uh, to you. Uh, Father, uh, being assembled here, we recognize with gratitude uh, happens because you have gone before us and you have set your love upon us. And we as a people recognize that uh, that happened uh, because you visited us, you added humanity unto yourself, you became that perfect sacrifice, living a perfect and righteous life and giving yourself up unto death that you might rise again as our protector and speaking for us. And so uh, this morning, uh, our prayer is that we uh, thank you for uh, deliverance. We thank you for eradicating sin, uh, its power, uh, and uh, its penalty, uh, and that you have satisfied your justice. And so we thank you for forgiving us for, for constantly trampling upon your name and trampling upon your kingdom's cause and purpose and living life virtually autonomously and in ignorance of you and your word. Thank you that your redemption is steadfast and immovable, and that we as a people can be assembled here today with great confidence that you have covered our sin and that you are sustaining us and that you called us to remain with you forever. We pray this gratefully in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So listen to the psalmist who was saved to speak. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. The confession of the psalmist, um, done in speech, in word. He has cried out, as we're called to cry out, to speak. Uh, we're saved to do this very thing that the psalmist does. That doesn't save us, but it exemplifies as an emblematic of those who are saved. So if, you, if this represents you, if you uh, and I cry out like this, it is evidence that God has saved our souls, that you're trusting in Christ and Christ alone, Christ alone for forgiveness. You are among the elect. You are sitting here saved, and that should be your confidence. For he wrote these things that you and I may know that we are saved. He wrote these things that we may know that we are saved. Let's rejoice together in gratitude, and I mean gratitude, speaking forth uh, in song together as we sing hymn 274 together. Hymn 274. Please stand with me. Son, in 
Endless is the victory, thou our death has won. Angels in bright raiment rolled the stone away, kept the folded grave close where thy body Conquering Son, endless is the victory thou for death has won. O Jesus, meet us, risen from the tomb. Lovingly greet us, scatters fear and gloom. Let the church with gladness hymns of triumph sing, for the Lord it liveth, death has lost its sting. Thine be the glory, risen conquering sun, endless is the victory thou or death has won. Prince of life, life is not with thee, aid us in our strife, make us more than conquerors through thy deathless love, bring us safe through Jordan to thy home above, thine be the glory, risen conquering son, endless is the victory the Lord death has won. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord, your God, and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. This reading from, of course, Deuteronomy reminds us that even today we, we think that people say, oh, there's prophets. And occasionally they say things that might actually come true. However, the standard of this Bible is that everything that a prophet says must come true for it to be a true prophet. And our true prophet, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ, who we talked about as Dave opened the service. You know, our service builds. It starts with the beginning of the scripture, or as we, as we bring our, read our scripture at the invocation. Then we, of course, have to confess our sins. Now, in response to that, to the forgiveness of God, we have an opportunity to give back to him. We never want to deprive you, we never want to be deprived of the opportunity to give back a portion of what God has so richly given us. This is important. So once again, would the ushers please serve us.
Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we pray that we have had the opportunity to give with, it, with cheerful hearts, that we've given back to you a portion of what you have given us. Pray that these gifts be used wisely to further the work here at Bethel and beyond. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to serve you in this way, in this place. Lord, we live in dark times. No matter how we get our news, whether that's over the air, on the television, internet, print, whatever, perhaps our hands are fearful, maybe even tremble a bit at what latest atrocity, what latest casualty, what has happened in our culture in the coarsening of this. And Lord, we look down through history, and so often in your word, you tell the people of Israel to remember, and we need to remember. We remember there were very dark times in the past, Sodom and Gomorrah, in Elijah's time, where he had to be reminded that you had saved a remnant for yourself. The Reformation prior to that was a very dark time for the church itself, or the world prior to the flood, how awful that must have been. In more, more recent times, in the 18th century in England, things were just as horrible in their, their own way as they are today. We've had persecutions, inquisitions, crusades, many things down through the ages. But each time, you have been sovereign over these events. Of all people, we should be clear-eyed as we view the current events, knowing that nothing is beyond your control that we are grateful for you and for your, your work in the world and in our lives. Lord, we're a small body, yet there are many things, many illnesses, many work issues that we need to bring before you. Many of us know that just very recently, within the last day, Evangeline Nelson was diagnosed with a burst appendix. And Lord, we're grateful that in that occasion, that the hospital was not far away, the surgeons were not far away, and as serious as that might have been, that she was able to receive the right kind of medical care at that moment. Lord, we're grateful for that. We ask that there be no infection, that her healing would be complete, and that she would be restored once again to us, and we're thankful for all the things that you have done. Lord, we do know that uh, the, the Schaffers have continued to ask for for, uh, for healing for Colleen. Uh, we know that uh, Emily's grandfather, Richard, has bladder cancer. Tom's brother, Chris, has had some surgery. Pray that all these things would be touched by your hand. Lord, we know, too, that as we read the prayer requests over and over again, we hear that there's colds and sickness and lingering coughs and lingering sicknesses and that are all part of winter and certainly part of the fall. So we do ask that, that our body be restored to health, that we not spread these to one another, and that, 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 that we would uh, be able to worship you, not as some are absent today because of illness. Lord, we do know there's many problems with businesses. More than one family in this church is dependent on the oil and gas business. Lord, we rejoice in a way when we go to the gas pump and pay less than a dollar seventy five for a gallon think that's great but there's always other unintended consequences for everything so lord we do ask that those businesses that are dependent on this and others that you would find a way for them to find an alternative way of caring for the families that that are dependent upon it we thank you for richard ross and his continued work and ask for more we ask for special blessing on Dorothy as once again she's confronted with a contract that may end very soon. So we ask that the situation with Alpine be very clear and that she would have her income assured. Think of Steve Musto and Marlon and Brittany as well for the businesses that they, they also could use jobs and use ways to, to care for themselves. Lord, we thank you for the new lives that are growing within Sarah Brandon and Jessica Birchneider. And we are grateful that you've chosen to add to our number in that way. We ask that these young people, these babies, be 
develop healthily and that they, we look forward to the day that we can meet these covenant children. Lord, there are a million things that we could pray for. But Lord, these are the concerns that we have of this body, this day, and this hour. So hear our prayer, Lord, as we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate our time of dedication by concluding that by singing hymn 252, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. 252. Please stand to sing. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, I richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt. Amen. Please be seated. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore, as the psalmist writes. Yes, it does indeed. And his testimonies are fully true. And we will know them even more clearly when we hear his word now brought to us and rightly divided. Family of God, turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians 3, as well as turning your bulletin to the bulletin insert. Use that to take notes. Read along. We're on a new section, chapter 3, but it really is not a new section, as you'll see this morning. It, it's a, it, it flows from what we saw when we were last here in Thessalonians, 2 through 19, or 20 of chapter 2. I'll read um, 1 through 5 this morning of chapter 3, but no, the whole chapter is um, the subject of our discussion and study in the coming weeks. This is indeed the word of God. So let me invite you to stand together with me at the reading of this God's word. <clears throat> Hear now the word of our Lord. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, 
and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith. For fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor should be in vain. As Father, reading of God's word, let's pray together. Father, what a delight it is to come here now with open Bibles and the privilege to fellowship with you. That this thing called the foolishness of preaching would be a vehicle by which you would meet with your people, commune with us, and feed us, and transform us, and conform us to the image of Christ, giving hope to the weak and the lifting up of the downcast. Lord, we pray you'd bless this time towards that end and more. Feed us richly, we ask. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Christ gave a rather sobering charge in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Aside from this passage calling us to have heavenly treasures as that which drive us in life, which as we've seen by way of footnote last time, a large part of those heavenly treasures are God's people. Aside from this passage calling us to make sure that our heavenly treasures are our treasures, it also tells us that what we treasure will change us. Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now the heart here is not the emotion. He's not saying where your treasure is, there will your love be. He, he's, he says, rather, as you know, and we saw this last time we, we were, I was here, and that was that the heart in the Hebrew mind, and the Greek mind, was the seat of the mind. The emotions was the, the bowels, the splunkna, but the heart was the mind, the will, the desires, the goals, the motivation. Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his what, mind or heart? His heart, but it's the same thing. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The heart is the mind. And Christ says, where your treasure is, that will dictate what your mind values, desires, grieves over, is motivated by, moved by, driven towards. Interesting. So Christ says, man, value kingdom treasure, and that treasure will impact you. We see that in our passage directly this morning. In fact, if you wanted a theme of, 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 of 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 3, 13, you'd say where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Notice, Paul tells us in 19 and 20 of chapter 2 that his, one of his greatest treasures in life are the people of God on the day of the coming of Jesus Christ. Notice verse 19. Who is our hope, our joy, our crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? You are our glory and joy, chapter 3, verse 1, therefore. In your study of the Bible, anytime you read a therefore, you always ask yourself, what's the therefore, therefore? Why is it there? And in this case, the therefore is there because Paul from chapter 2, 19 and 20 is going to explain, give the basis for chapter 3, 1 through 13. Because people are my greatest treasure, therefore, chapter 3. Do you see it? Our, 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 our text is all about what happens when people are your greatest treasure. 
That's what chapter three is all about. When people are your greatest, when God's people are your greatest treasure, it's gonna change the way you think, brothers and sisters. Think about it, when your treasure is wealth, things that moth and rust can destroy and thieves break in and steal, what you call a crisis is determined. What you long for is determined. How you live is determined. <laughs> How you respond when what you value is, is not there, right? All of that is dictated. Paul says, our greatest treasure is people, God's people. Therefore, there's going to be impact, huge impact. And we see that impact in our text this morning. You've got the quotes there. Leon Morris right, wrote the chapter divisions here. The chapter division here is unfortunate. Therefore, links what follows to what was preceded. Gordon Fee added, what, what is about to be offered is an explanation, chapter 3, explanation for his sending Timothy to them. The reason for it lies with the preceding sentences. Chapter 3 the reason for chapter 3 is chapter 2. And what's chapter 2? Chapter 2, 19, 20. I value people more than life. People are one of my greatest treasures in glory. And because of that, chapter 3, verses 1 and following. This morning, we're going to begin a couple-week study of this chapter in which we are going to be looking at the consequences, or as I've titled it here, when God's people are your treasure. So, this is a fascinating chapter for us, therefore. This chapter is prophecy. It's prediction. It's what's going to happen in your life, brothers and sisters, if you value the people of God in the glory, in the kingdom of God. If you value this, chapter 3, 1 through 13 will not just be Paul. It will also be you and me. Let's look at them one by one. First, notice the sacrifice willingly endured. Verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. On the surface, this verse seems rather innocuous, but boy, I'll tell you what, this is huge. In fact, it's, it's, it's in the emphatic uh, place. Hence, it's what Paul's stressing. The first thing he wants to stress, because you are our value. I want you to notice the great sacrifice that I am willing to undergo because of that. Let's look at both. There's, there's two phrases. Let's look at them. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer. The word for endure there is the Greek word stego. And it means to, um, to cover, to ward off by covering, to bear up against and therefore to protect. It's a word that refers in shipping to a watertight vessel or to a roof that doesn't leak. The implication here is that Paul said, is saying, family of God, because you're my value, I came to the point in my life where my boat was sinking and my roof was leaking. In essence, you're seeing Paul here broken, beside himself, burdened. I mean, this is a strong word and it's a strong sentence. Paul here is burdened. He can't handle it. Well, what's going on? Well, recall when Paul went to Thessalonica, he preached the gospel and this, in a, a, group of, a small group of Jews and Gentiles radically turned from their sin to God. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 They themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Recall that Thessalonica was the, the, the closest and largest port city to Mount Olympus. And that meant that Thessalonica became the idol capital of the ancient world. When you thought of Thessalonica, better yet, when you thought of Corinth in the ancient world, you thought of moral depravity. When you thought of Thessalonica, you thought of idolatry and idols. Because they were the idol capital of the world. And because of that, for this group, a small group, to turn to God from idols to serve him and love God... 
it caused a huge uh, commotion, not only in Christianity, but in that city. Three people groups were horribly offended by this uh, transformation. The Jews, of course, were bothered because Jews became followers of Christ. Greeks were bothered because these people left their trade guilds and denied those gods. And the Romans were bothered because Thessalonica was a, was a Roman city, a free city, which meant their chief god was Caesar. And for these guys to turn to God from idols went, meant that they would have rejected the Caesar cult. It would have made them the enemy of the state. And so Paul, as you know the story, was chased out of Thessalonica. And immediately the Thessalonians became the object of great persecution. Chapter 1, verse 6, You also became imitators of, of us and of the, the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, Man, we kept telling you and telling you that we, and we is not just Paul and Silas and Timothy, it's the Thessalonians. We all, not y'all, but wall, right? What's the southern we all? Wall. We're all going to be suffering persecution. And so it came to pass. In fact, it was so bad, these Thessalonian persecutors chased Paul out of Thessalonica, and they were so dogged in their pursuit, they continued on the heels of Paul 50 miles on foot to Berea. And when they got to Berea, when Paul got there, these persecutors caught up with them, and then they turned the entire city of Berea against Paul, and Paul once again was chased out, and he came down to Athens. Well, Paul knows how, how, how um, uh, uh, fanatical these persecutors were, and what no doubt they were doing to the people of God in Thessalonica, um, he, he was beside himself. Add to that, Paul was only in Thessalonica three to six mo- uh, weeks. We know at least three weeks, but he also received two different offerings from Macedonia during this time of food, of money, and to allow for that time, he's probably there up to six weeks, which means this young church, who's the object of a persecution Paul had not yet seen in his goings, Paul's first missionary journey, a little bit of persecution. Second one, this is big time persecution. He has not seen anyone chase him 50 miles until now. So Paul is beside himself. This this small, young group of people are the object of such fanatical attacks, fanatical hatred against Christ and against God's people. And then you add to that, Paul decided somewhere going south that he'd go back north and go back and disciple and minister and help these young believers. And we read in chapter 2, verse 18, Satan thwarted them. So every time Paul tried to get back to minister, Satan said, uh-uh. And so as we saw there, he, Satan cut slits in his road that were so deep he couldn't get past them. So Paul comes to Athens and he is emotionally mentally and spiritually beside himself. He is struggling like no one's business. MacArthur wrote, even though he faced his own trials, 3-7, uh, Paul was more concerned about his people's spiritual well-being in the midst of their difficulties. Paul's love was far more than a mere sentimental desire for social fellowship with the church. It was Paul's desire to help the Thessalonians fulfill God's calling to be loyal to the truth and to experience spiritual maturity in their lives. Why? 2 verse 19 and 20. Paul wanted to see these people standing beside him in glory, worshiping God. That's what he lived for. That's what he was, that's what his burden was. And the thought that these same people who he longed to be with him in glory, worshiping Christ, were the object and the ire of these fanatical monsters caused Paul to be moved with such worry and burden and grief that he was distracted in his ministry. So what did he do? Well, notice, second phrase, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. Incredible statement. That's the emphasis. We thought it best to be left behind. Three statements, left behind. This word here, me, is a strong word. It means to be abandoned, bereft. The word is used of leaving one's loved ones at death, Mark chapter 12. As such, it is a term of deep 
and rich emotion. Grief, unconsolable grief. Paul says, we, we were so burdened by you. Let me tell you the, the great lengths we were willing uh, to go. We were willing to be bereft. Completely bereft. Notice the next phrase, at Athens. Now, you say, what's the big deal, bereft? Brothers and sisters, God did not make us to be alone, Genesis 2. God saw that man was alone and it was not good. That doesn't mean man was single. That means man was out fellowship without. That's what Calvin says. Genesis 2, 19 is not saying that, that therefore God ordains marriage for all people. No, we know that's not true. Rather, Genesis 2, verse 19 tells us, or 18 uh, tells us, that God has said that being without fellowship is not good. It's not good for man to be alone. And yet Paul was willing to go to this length. In fact, in the Bible, to be alone is to be cursed. Did you know that? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. The word woe means cursed. Cursed is the Christian Cursed is the man who doesn't have fellowship. This is Paul with one hand stuck in a vice. And he looks out and sees one of his children in the street playing with the truck coming down. And he has to make a split decision. Does he cut his arm off and save that child or does he fend for himself? Paul chopped his arm off in order to go deliver and protect those people. That's what Paul is doing here. That's the emotion. He was willing to be left Behind at Athens. And you go, what's the significance? Well, you all know that um, at Athens was the place that Paul went to the Areopagus, right? You know this story, Acts chapter 17. If Thessalonica was the idol capital of the ancient world, if Corinth was the sin capital of the ancient world, Athens was known as the intellectual capital. It, it, was, it had the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers and, and all these intelligent, intelligentsia. And get this, Paul was willing to be left behind to face Athens. And there he goes to the Areopagus. Most of you know he goes there in Acts chapter 17. But what most of you don't know, I would be willing to guess, is that the Areopagus is a reference to the Judicial high court in Greece, in Athens, not Greece, in Athens. And as the judicial high court in Athens, if you read Acts 17, 19, or is that a 10? I think it's a 19. Acts, Acts uh, 17, 19, you'll read that Paul didn't willingly go to the Areopagus. He was debating with the Stoic philosophers, and they brought Paul before the Areopagus. The Areopagus is the Sanhedrin of Athens who held the power of death if they didn't like your defense. Unlike in Palestine, if you wanted to kill someone, you had to ask permission. At Athens, the Areopagus could say, death, and you're dead. Do you understand that when Paul went to the Areopagus, his life was on the line? Me, we don't realize that. We just think, oh, Paul, Paul's down there living in the Hilton, and Timothy and Silas are there, and he decides, you know what, I can go without you guys for a couple days. Why don't you go north, help the uh, Thessalonians. I'll, I'll stay here, eat bonbons, and debate philosophers. Pretty fun time. Pretty uh, a cozy job. No, brothers and sisters, Paul's life was on the line in Athens. And Paul says, let me tell you something. You all are so important to me. I, I was willing to be bereft of fellowship in Athens such that I was now, look at that little word, alone. Manos. That's the topper. It's bad enough to be abandoned as a missionary in the intellectual capital of the world. But to be completely alone, bereft of fellowship, encouragement, support, prayer, counsel, defense, people to help you as you're debating, people to give you feedback. Brothers and sisters, that is called ministerial suicide. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 says, encourage one another as long as day as it is day, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do you know what soul Christians do? They get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
So Hebrews says, man, take care lest there be in anyone you an evil and unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God, but fellowship together. Paul says, I'll tell you what, arm's stuck here. I can't get there. I'm going to have this thing chopped off that you guys might be saved. And that's exactly what Paul was willing to do. Morris wrote, it was with a, great, a very real sense of deprivation that Paul had said goodbye to Timothy. Though he knew that his helper's departure had been necessary, he had felt himself abandoned. He had had to face the cultured philosophers and idolaters of Athens and to face them alone. I dare say that none of, no one here in this room will ever be asked to make a decision that Paul is making here. To choose to, for the benefit of other, uh, someone else's spiritual health, to, to, to sacrifice that much. But the question asked that we need to ask, are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to sacrifice for the spiritual benefit of someone else? What great, what links are you willing to go to for the spiritual benefit of other people? We'll answer that in a couple of weeks. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We're going to come back to this. However, I want you to notice one thing very, very important. Notice, as you and I hold people as our greatest treasure, the people of God, notice, brothers and sisters, what, will, what, what change will take place in you? Do you realize that when people become your program, when God's people become your greatest treasure, your personality will change. Your values will change. The conversation this past week with a dear brother, both of us were saying how we are not people people. If you define people, people as people, people are, are energized by people. Non-people, people get worn out by people. I get worn out by people. Sunday night, I am tired. Now, I love people, but I'm tired. <laughs> they don't energize. I know some of you are energized by Sunday night. You're just, you're just zoo buzzing. Man, I'm not. I am, I'm on a death spiral ready to collapse, right, by 7 o'clock. Um, but you know what's amazing? All the non-people people in the world, when you value the people of God, it transforms your personality. Yeah, I, I naturally would rather sit by myself in a corner and talk to one person. But when you value the people of God, loving Christ in glory, that changes you. Such that now you're not content to simply sit back and live your own solitary life. You must, you, you must needs invest in the people of God. If you will value the people of God, notice the sacrifice that you will be willing to pay. You will. Notice the roadmap of your growth and grace. Notice as you grow, it will involve, as I've written in here, a growing willingness to sacrifice time, money, convenience for the sake of, another, of another's maturation, a growing willingness to suffer slander, abuse, even persecution that others might know or grow in the Lord. Men who are married, is your wife's soul, not her body, not her, her, her energy whereby she fixes you food and cleans your clothes, but is the soul of your wife your chief priority? If it is, you will be willing to undergo so much for her growth in grace. Parents and your kids, children and your parents, children and your siblings, men and women with your coworkers, all of a sudden, difficult people, you view them completely different. Man, why are you so willing to talk to that guy? He's always so rude. Because my passion is to see that guy in glory. It's not about me. It's not about my reputation or my pride or my sense of security. It's about Christ's glory and them standing there worshiping Christ on the last day. Wow. It changes you. MacArthur wrote, a true pastor is not an empire builder. 
A true pastor is a man who loves deeply. What we mean by that initially is, is, is he has affection for his people. He, he really cares about his people. And he bears a heavy, heavy burden of concern about his people. Later he would write, A man with a true and faithful pastoral heart is not concerned about his own success or his own reputation, nor is he preoccupied with his own trials. Rather, he is deeply concerned with the spiritual condition of his people, for whom he will suffer and rejoice with an unflagging affection. Christian, you are seeing a roadmap of how God is going to mature you in your walk. This is all people. When you value people in glory, all of a sudden now it affects what you're willing to endure in this life. Yeah, I'm willing to go without for the sake of my vacation. I'm willing to go into debt for the sake of this television. <clears throat> Let me ask you something. Are you willing to give up your, your time, your positions, your um, value, you name it, that other people might grow in their walk. Brothers and sisters, that's a picture of where you're going to be as you grow in grace. Notice, secondly, the qualified minister. So Paul says, therefore, when we can endure it no longer, man, we, we said, abandon us, abandon me. Here, go away, go minister. Notice, therefore, in choosing to send Timothy he gives us the qualification for what made Timothy qualified to minister to people who are your priority. Notice 2A. Therefore, when we can endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And, verse 2, we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker, in the gospel of Christ. When Paul couldn't go, he sent the next best thing. An eminently qualified minister in the kingdom of God, Timothy. For Timothy's qualifications, you go to Philippians 2, 19 through 22. For any man or woman's qualification to minister as a, as a servant in Christ's body, but as officers, it would be men, of course. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, Galatians 1, Acts 6, 1 Peter 5, Isaiah 6, Psalm 101. There's a lot of passages. Here, Paul chooses in the context to emphasize three things about Timothy. Now, what's interesting about this is Timothy's already gone and come back. And Paul's writing this in response to Timothy going and coming back. So why would Paul give the qualification to Timothy after he's already gone and come back? Well, the answer is he's going back. He's going back a second time. He's going to bear this letter back to the Thessalonians. And Paul wants them to see, man, this is what makes a minister qualified to minister. Psalm 101, 6b, he who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. Brothers and sisters, one qualification for a minister of your heart will be someone who's blameless. Well, notice what this text says that Paul emphasizes about Timothy. What made this man blameless? What made this man a qualified minister to the Thessalonians? And get it again. It's a roadmap. This is what your life is going to look like if you value people. Because this is what becomes important. Notice, first thing, we sent Timothy, our brother. Simply put, Timothy was saved. Saved by, by the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? Let me give you a little bit of background here, quickly. When you and I are born, when anyone's born, we're born, uh, typically, we're born as slaves to self. We're born with this, with this overriding passion for autonomy, self-love, independence. Remember when Adam and Eve were tempted? Well, how did, how did Satan tempt Eve? He tempted her with, the, with the, the idea, the concept of a life without God. Genesis 3, 5, God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. You'll be just like me, just like God, independent. You'll get to do what you want, when you want, where you want. You're going to be just like God. And you know what? Adam and Eve jumped. While Satan couldn't attack Adam and Eve directly, God wouldn't have stood for it. God did allow Satan to talk to Adam and Eve. And you know what Adam and Eve did or what, what Satan did? Satan successfully talked them into themselves rebelling against God so that they themselves could be like God. Knowing good, knowing bad. Determining good, determining bad. Choosing to do it, choosing not to. It's up to me, I'm God. In fact, you know what the definition of repentance is? 
When you think of repentance, you think from turning from your sin to the cross of Jesus Christ and being saved. Yet Matthew 5, 3, and 4 tells us that, that repentance ought to characterize the Christian's lives. What, you're supposed to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, every single day? No. Repentance does mean turning from sin to Christ, accepting him as Lord and Savior, definitely. But it means a whole lot more than that. Repentance, brothers and sisters, is turning from self-reliance, self-dependence. Turning from a world where your judgment is king to God-reliance, God-trust, where God's word is king. So when Paul says Timothy was our beloved brother, we're sending to you our brother, he's telling us that Timothy is a servant of Christ who's dependent upon Christ in and through all things. His reliance wasn't on his own wisdom, ability, or efforts. His all in all was Jesus Christ. That is what made Timothy qualified. Timothy, our brother. Next phrase, God's fellow worker. Now this is very odd. Paul, we expect Paul to say, Timothy's my fellow worker. He calls him God's fellow worker, which gives you a sense of, of how um, auspicious or how, how incredible that this is. Soon ergon is where we get the word uh, synergy. Soon means with, ergon means work. He is a worker with God. Now, when, if someone's a worker with God, it implies three things. His goal, God's goal, is your goal. The means God has established for attaining that goal are your means. And thirdly, the attitude of the mind with which you go about your service was Christ, is Christ's attitude of mind. Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what it means to be a fellow worker with God. It's to be someone whose goal is God's goal, whose vehicle to get that goal done is your vehicle, and whose mind in getting it done is God's mind. In essence... It's what Paul calls a gospel man or woman. Do you remember that expression from Romans 1.1? Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called as apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. That phrase could be loosely translated, a gospel man. The word for set apart here is not the typical word for set apart. The word here is aphorizo, which carries two things. Negatively, it means to cut off interests and attachments 2 Corinthians 6, for example, do not touch what is unclean. That's the same word. Cut off anything that's unclean. Cut it off. Secondly, positively, it speaks of the devotion of all faculties and ambitions towards the fulfillment of the set apart end. Acts uh, uh, 13, the Spirit said, set apart, same word, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. The call of the kingdom involves both. Cutting off and setting to. Thus Paul's goals. Life, future, happiness, contentment, we're all set apart unto the gospel and so determined by it. Did you get that? Paul's goals, desires, everything were set apart and determined by. Accordingly, where he went was dictated by the gospel. You got the verses there. What he ate, his relationships, his freedom, what he rejoiced over, everything he did was dictated by the gospel. I become all things to all men that I may by all means save some, and I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. That is what is meant as being a fellow worker with God. That was Timothy. Timothy was so identified, tells us why he was qualified to go in Paul's stead and minister. God's will and God's way was Timothy's will in way. So he was one who had gone on a death march to self and now was, was living in reliance upon God, his word, his judgment, his way, his motives. Secondly, he was a man who was a fellow worker. God's kingdom was his kingdom. God's will was his will. God's glory was his glory. Thirdly, would you notice, he was God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ. That's incredible. When we hear gospel of Christ, most of you probably think the, the cross. What's the gospel of Christ? Well, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. That's the gospel of Christ. That is, but you just described this much of it. Okay? That is the gospel. But that's not the whole gospel. Okay? That's this much of the gospel. Listen to the phrase, the gospel of Christ. Gospel in the Greek, good news. It's a proclamation. It's, it's what would be heralded at a city gate. 
right? The king has a baby. Hear ye, hear ye. Okay, this is the good news. This is the, the, the a proclamation of good news. And what's the good news? It's the good news of what? The cross? No. A Christos. What's a Christos? Christos is Christ. Okay, Messiah. Christos is the Greek word for Messiah. It's the Greek word for anointed one. It's the Greek word for king. When Paul says Timothy is God's fellow worker in the good news, in proclaiming the good news of king, of King Jesus, that's the gospel. It's the good news of King Jesus. Let me back you up just a little bit. Genesis 1, God creates his kingdom on the earth. The kingdom language is throughout all the chapter 1, chapter 2. God established at the creationist world a kingdom over which he planned to co-reign with man, right? Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. Yet Satan had already fallen and while God would protect man from an direct assault from Satan against man, Satan couldn't do that and he hated God. What did Satan do? He did the next best thing. God allowed Satan to talk to man. So Satan came and talked to man and and the woman, and he got them, as we just said, to defect against God, to turn their backs against God, Genesis 3, 1 through uh, uh, 7. And when they did this, get this, the kingdoms of the world were handed over to Satan, Luke 4, 5 through 7. The kingdoms of the world became Satan. And so far from being an autonomous man to do what they want, mankind became a slave, ignorant slave be that. They still think that they're free to do what they want. They're their own man. They can do whatever they want. They don't know they're enslaved to Satan. Satan became the prince, the power of the air. He now holds the kingdoms of this world by himself. But that's not the end of the story. Genesis 3.15, you know what the promise is? God would send his son to destroy Satan. Genesis 3.15. Do you understand what this promise, the first gospel, the proto-evangelium is? It's a promise of conflict. It's a promise of war. Yes, my kingdom has been toppled. The world now belongs to Satan. But I will send my son. I myself will come. And I will come and I will destroy the works of the devil. Luke 19.10. Wow. So do you know what was heralded when Jesus Christ came? (laughs) Not the cross. Don't miss it, brothers and sisters. Not merely the cross, I should say. Cross is an essential part of God's kingdom, of course. But guess, get this, brother. If you haven't seen it, get it. The first thing we read about Christ's formal public ministry is Matthew 4. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Christ came proclaiming a kingdom. (laughs) Matthew 9, Jesus was going about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Incredible. Matthew 26, we said every single week, Christ said at the last uh, uh, supper, I will not eat eat of this fruit of the vine until now, on until when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when Jesus Christ comes back, do you know what happens? His kingdom smashes completely and totally Satan's kingdom. Revelation eleven fifteen. The seventh angel sounded and there, loud, uh, there arose loud voices. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he, Jesus, will reign forever and ever. That's the good news. That's the gospel. The gospel of Christos. The gospel of of the king. That's what Timothy went to proclaim. The gospel of a sovereign. Awesome God. And you know what the message that Paul brought? Acts 20, 25 tells us. Paul summarized his preaching ministry as, quote, preaching the kingdom. Acts 20, 25. That's what Paul went around doing. He was preaching the kingdom. So when he sent Timothy to go up as God's fellow work in the gospel of Messiah, 
He indicates that Timothy was one who diligently labored for the coming and so the establishing of the reign and rule of Christ over this world. He did this not only by proclaiming the good news of his coming, which would have included his substitutionary death on the cross, but also by himself living in light of, it, of this kingdom and laboring for others to do the same. Brothers and sisters, what happens when the people of God become your treasure? You will be one who relies exclusively on the gospel. You'll be one who co-labors with God in his kingdom purpose. You'll be one who labors to hasten the coming of Christ's kingdom in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And you'll be one who's willing to sacrifice your health and welfare for the sake and the purpose of God's people. What you've got before us this day and in the coming weeks is the question of the chicken and the egg. Which comes first? The desire Which comes first, the desire or the value? All right? If you value people, it'll change what you do. But if you do these things, it'll make you value people. Which comes first? The answer is both. As you and I grow, what you're seeing here is a description of what, how you and I are going to mature. So how do you respond to something like this? First and foremost, don't let this burden you. If you go, man, this isn't me. Well, allow yourself to understand the grace of God such that it has forgiven you. You're forgiven, brothers and sisters. Now, with that lens, knowing the grace of Jesus Christ, take something like this and allow it to inspire you, to set the course of your life. For example, my boys were training. They got an exercise known as glute hams. That's your bottom and your hamstrings. It was a machine. And it was designed to, do, to work your bottom and your hamstring. You got on it with your legs, and you basically lifted yourself up by, you think it looks like your lower back. If you're doing the exercise wrong, you'll feel pain in your back. If you're doing the exercise right, you'll feel pain in your bottom and your hamstring. Now, if I just said, boys, hop up there and do some flips, you know, whoop, 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 do some reps, they'd probably do it wrong and be all back. But the moment I said, if you're feeling it in your back, uh-uh, you're not doing them right. You should feel them in your bottom and your hamstrings. Oh, I'm feeling them in my back, Dad. Okay, well, let's do it wrong. Flex your legs. Pull with your legs. Don't pull with your back. Pull your body up with your legs. Concentrate. Focus on your legs. And you know what happened? They did it. And they worked their glute hands because they knew what was supposed to be worked. Brothers and sisters, you have before you a roadmap, an instruction manual. This is what you're going to grow in right here. One, a willingness to suffer for people. Right now, most of you, my guess is you're willing to suffer for all kinds of causes. For uh, presidential candidates. You're willing to go to work and be identified as a Republican. That takes a lot of boldness. Brothers and sisters, that's because you're valuing an earthly kingdom. You're willing to be known as one of those fanatic people who care about our educational system, who care about, name it, who are anti-abortion and anti-homosexual, you know, whatever. But I'm not against a homosexual. I'm against the sinful practice. Whatever. Brothers and sisters, as you value people, you're going to find yourself to be known as a people who are burdened by the welfare of of people. Number one. Secondly, you're going to become a people who are burdened by the gospel. If, me, if, if my job is to care for people, how can we genuinely care for them? I can use Freud or I can use our father. Okay, I can use Rogers or Jung or I can use Jesus. I think most of you are going to say Jesus. In fact, all of you are going to say Jesus. If that's true, then you're going to be clinging to Jesus. It's going to dictate who you are, how you grow, what you do, what you become. It should start to set the pace for your prayer life. So, brothers and sisters, we've seen this, this morning when people are your treasure, notice the sacrifice you're willing to endure. Notice the characteristics that will start to more and more characterize you as a, a Christian. May God give us the grace as people to so grow and so be moved, but to do it with intelligence and with purposed
purpose, effort, so that you know that you're not beating the air, but growing. Let's pray. Father God, what a delight it is to gaze upon this passage and see a roadmap for what we're going to be. Therefore, because our longing is to see one another in glory, therefore, give us the grace, O Lord, to be willing to be left behind at Athens alone. Give us grace to be a people who truly would be trusting in Christ alone, who would go on a spiritual death march to self, self agenda, self glory, self um, worth, self benefit, but to live for your glory, your benefit, your worth, and, and, and one another's. Give us grace, O Lord, to be a people who are kingdom people, who therefore work alongside you, with you, for you, in your kingdom. And therefore, Lord, give us grace to be a people who are diligently laboring for the good news of the coming of Messiah, who by your life, death, and resurrection secured a people for yourself, and by your session in heaven are bringing your people home. Thus, Lord, give us the grace to live in light of your sovereignty, your power, your authority, your goodness, your grace, and compassion, that we of all people appreciate my brother uh, uh, Ken's prayer uh, request during the pastoral time that of all people we would live in light of the sovereignty of our God with the security knowing that we are men and women of destiny and therefore never downtrodden never defeated even though we are in the valley of weeping God may it be a spring as we gaze upon you God we entrust ourselves to you towards this end in Jesus name